It is great to continue to worship with you today, and I'm thankful for another opportunity to share God's Word with you. I want you to take a look at some pictures of those in our Gateway family that submitted snapshots of them worshiping recently on a Sunday, even as we are now. I appreciate them so much submitting these pictures so that we could continue to be engaged and be involved with one, with one another, even though we are actually apart. And I want to be great when we're able to be back in church together, and I'm looking forward to that, and I'm certain that you are as well. I do have an assignment for you this week, um, and uh, really for the next couple of weeks. So many of you have been doing some unique things during these days at home, whether it's been individually or as a family unit. And so if you snapped any pics of those unique things, uh, please send those in so I can share those with all of us next Sunday and the following Sundays. And so if you have something planned this week or next, uh, please make sure to take a quick picture of that and send it in as well. You say, well, what exactly are you talking about? Maybe you painted the kitchen while you've been at home. Maybe you did a fire pit with your family or you bought a new bike and you went on a, a new bike adventure. Maybe you walked a trail or built something for the house. Maybe you and your kids or ha you're having that Uno game up to 10,000 points. Maybe you're just simply watching a movie as a family. I want to use those pictures as part of my new sermon series that I begin today entitled Unstuck. Unstuck, moving from isolation to intention. Now, how many of you have said recently, I'm so tired of being stuck in this house? How many of you have kids that have said, I can't wait to go back to school or go on vacation so I'm not stuck here anymore? Well, truthfully, uh, many of us feel like we're stuck. We're stuck at home, we're not able to go out to eat or take a trip or go shopping. Uh, we're stuck at home and not able to go to work and, and perform our jobs in a normal manner. We're stuck at home and not able to go to church and be with our church family. Uh, we're stuck at home and, uh, and we're really not knowing what tomorrow is going to hold. And so while my intent in this new teaching series is not to show you how to get out of the house and be more productive or to reveal to you some inside information that I have about when we're all going to go back to work, I do want to share with you that God can use these days to impact our lives. And I do believe these quarantine days have value. And I believe that we can grow spiritually during them. So is it possible to change our thinking and actions from being in isolation to that of living with greater intention? I believe the answer to that is yes. And so throughout this series, we will look at some in the Bible that faced isolation days and how God used those days in very powerful ways. And through their example, perhaps you will get unstuck and move from your isolation to greater intention. And so we begin with none other than Jesus fasting in the wilderness for 40 days in Matthew chapter 4, and facing temptation by the devil. And so how did Jesus move forward? By using his sword. And so the challenge before you today is this, use your sword. And so as we get unstuck by using our sword, there's several points of interest here in Matthew chapter 4 that I think are vital uh, pieces of information for us. And so the first thing that we find out is that the days of isolation and testing, they're very real. Now, that certainly goes without saying during these COVID-19 days that we are living in. But I want to share with you something here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We learn from these verses that Jesus knows what we are going through today and that he is our supreme example to follow. And so as we have our Bibles open in Matthew chapter 4, read with me in verse 1 and verse 2. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. There are three phrases in verse 1 that I think that are important for our study. If you'll notice, they are led up by the Spirit. 
Jesus made himself wholly available to God in order to be the channel through which God's power could be perfectly expressed in terms of a human life. He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now the wilderness of Judea was a hot, barren, and desolate area that extended west from the Dead Sea almost to Jerusalem. Mark tells us in Mark chapter 1 that Jesus also faced some wild beasts in that wilderness. And then Luke tells us in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus was indeed without food for these 40 days. So nowhere in Palestine could Jesus have been more isolated or in less comfort. So he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness than to be tempted by the devil. Simply put, Jesus was being enticed to do evil. Yet what Satan intended to do to lead Jesus into sin and disobedience, God used to demonstrate Christ's holiness and His worthiness. And that's God's plan for all of us as His children. Dr. John MacArthur makes a great point here. He says Christians cannot be tempted in a way that God cannot use for their good and His glory. James tells us, tells us this, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That really is God's plan and His purpose, to use times of isolation and testing as a means of strengthening our faith in Him and of our growing stronger in righteousness. You might think of it this way. God allows testing in our lives in order that our spiritual muscles may be exercised and strengthened. And so whether the testing is by God's initiative or is sent by Satan, God will always use it to produce good in us when we meet the test in His power. There's a poem that Sue Nepp wrote uh, a few years back, and, and she simply writes this, Lord, sometimes you have to break me so you can rebuild. Wound me so you can heal. Let me walk in darkness so that I can see your light. Let me be confused so I seek your truth. Let me feel emptiness so, I can, so that you can fill me. Let me be lonely so I can see what a friend that you are. Lord, sometimes you have to let me learn the hard things so that I can be a gentle teacher. Lord, you have to let me be void of feeling so I must walk by faith. Lord, sometimes you have to take away my future plans, she writes, so that you can teach me to live one day at a time. And then, Lord, sometimes you have to show me the futility of life so I will see that everything is lost compared to the, compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Isolation and testing, they're real. And we know that, and Jesus knew that, providing us an example to get unstuck. But in addition to that testing and that isolation, we also find out today that the devil is sure to tempt us to fall. Here again in Matthew chapter 4, Satan uses three temptations to test Jesus. Each one was designed to weaken and to destroy the Messiah and his mission. So we, take, we go back to our Bibles, Matthew chapter 4. Notice temptation number 1 found in verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. These words were presented to Jesus to try and get him to distrust the providential care of his Father and to use his own divine powers to serve himself. Temptation number two comes to us in verse number five. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. This temptation was to presume on the Father's care by putting him to the test. And then temptation number three comes to us in verse 8 and verse 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. The final leading here was for Jesus to renounce the way of God the Father and to submit to the way of Satan. 
These temptations were very much real and very designed to get Jesus to fall during a time when he was very vulnerable. The temptations came directly after Jesus was baptized. We read about that in Matthew chapter 3, which certainly was a spiritual high in Jesus' earthly life. And they also came at a time when Jesus was isolated in the wilderness, as we've pointed out. And they came at a point of physical exhaustion and emotional weakness. Jesus had not eaten for 40 days, and he was hungry. All carried the intent of distracting Jesus from what was important, carrying out the mission of the Father in his earthly ministry that is just now beginning. So listen this morning. Satan knows when we are weak whether it be a high or a low time in our lives. And he will do whatever he can to bait us or trap us to, trap us to make us fall. We have to be careful. We have to, to pay attention. For these days of quarantine can be just that bait or that trap of temptation that leads us to sin. It's been said, unless we have within us that which is above us, we shall soon yield to that which is about us. And that's so true. These days of isolation, of testing, the real. And the devil will tempt us and try us to make us fall. But we also see this last point, that the Word of God is our source of strength and victory. Let me say that one more time. The Word of God is our source of strength and victory. The sole resource of the Lord during Satan's temptations was the Word of God. And may I add, it is the weapon that Satan fears more than anything else in this world. Notice that Jesus responds to each temptation with, It is written, referring to the Word of God. Now, we go back to temptation 1 that's found there in verse 3. Satan says, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now notice in verse 4, Jesus' response but he answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Temptation number two. We go back to verse six. Satan says, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from, from the very top, the pinnacle of the temple. And then he adds, It is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus responds to that in verse number seven. And he says, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And then temptation 3 was found there in verse 9. And Satan says to Jesus, all these, the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus responds there in verse number 10. He says, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. These words by Jesus showed his absolute confidence in the written scriptures as the authoritative word of the living God. Jesus refused to be shaken in his trust in the grace and the goodness of his Father or to take any ground other than that that's found in God's written word. Satan tried to use his powers of persuasion for food and fame and fortune just like he does to us today. But Christ used his sword to defeat the enemy. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul writes about the armor of God. There's five pieces of that armor that are strictly defensive. The belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, and the, and the helmet. But the last piece of armor is the sword. And while it can be used to ward off the blows of the enemy, it also possesses offensive capabilities as well. In both cases, it was necessary for a soldier to get rigid training on the proper use of the sword to gain maximum protection. And as Christian soldiers, we need the same rigid training to know how to properly handle the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And we need that sword because our enemy is real and powerful, and we need to be able to fight back when he attacks. The Holy Spirit uses the power of the Word to save our souls and, and then to give us spiritual strength to be mature soldiers for the Lord in fighting this corrupt and this evil world that we live in. Now you might ask today, how do I really use God's Word as a sword practically on a daily basis? Well, let me give you four quick things that I hope will be a help to you. First of all, you need to read God's Word. You need to read it. Uh, you, you can't use something if you don't know what it says. 
purposely set aside a time to read the Bible every day. Uh, whether it be early in the morning before everyone gets up, maybe it's late at night when everyone's gone to bed. Make preparations to do so. Uh, select a room. Uh, find a quiet place where there's no distractions. And then make sure that you set out to read a part of God's Word every day, whether it's a chapter, maybe it's a couple of, uh, of chapters, uh, maybe it's a reading plan that, that you have. And so read God's Word, but then secondly, study it. Have your materials together. Obviously, you need your Bible, but have a pen and paper to write down some things that God may speak to you about or something you want to look up. Maybe there's a devotional book that you're reading through or a reference book that you have in a particular book of the Bible that you're studying. And as you read a verse or a paragraph or a chapter, you know, find out, to ask, what does, this, what does this mean? What does it say? And then go a little bit deeper in finding out the true meaning of that particular verse in the context of that paragraph or even of that chapter. And so then write down a verse or a few verses that stand out to you, something that means something. Maybe you have a question about Maybe you need to meditate on those verses to find a deeper meaning or, or to, to realize that God is speaking to you today. And then maybe there's some verses that you just need to memorize so that you'll have it in your mind each day and be able to use later. So read God's Word, study God's Word. And then number three, simply apply God's Word. Ask this question, how does what I've read today and studied apply to me in my life? I pray and ask God to help you to understand His Word and to apply it to your heart and to your life. And then start living it out. Start living what you're reading about and studying. So read it, study it, apply it, and then simply use it. Think about and use God's Word to control what you say and how you act in a specific way. Uh, talk about the Bible with your family. Teach it to your family. Um, making application of it with them. But then realize that God's Word, it really is your source of power and victory to be able to live each day guiding you and directing you. Jesus certainly did that, and we find the conclusion of what happened to Him in Matthew chapter 4. Notice verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Satan had no more to offer. He had tempted Jesus with the three great sources of sin, that John tells us about in 1 John chapter 2, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I like what Dr. John Phillips says about that. He says, The devil had found the impenetrable armor of Christ's holiness to be impervious to all his temptations. I like how he writes that. Satan was thoroughly defeated by the Word of God. You know, there was a TV commercial a number of years ago for Prego Spaghetti Sauce. The mother was cooking the spaghetti and uh, the pot is full of what looks like a, a vibrant, bright red spaghetti sauce. The aroma appears to be filling the house. The son comes up and looks at his mother that's cooking the sauce and asks, Mom, where are the mushrooms? She simply replies, it's in there. But what about the sausage? Well, why, son, it's in there. Well, what about the ripe tomatoes? It's in there. Prego spaghetti sauce had a kick and a flavor because of what was on the inside. Every time the boy looked for something to explain what he smelled, his mother would reply, it's in there. If you're looking for victory today in your life, may I say to you, it's in the Bible. If you're looking for transformation, it's already in there. If you're looking for power, it's in there. If you're looking for deliverance, one more time, it's in there. If you're looking for hope or purpose or wisdom or direction, it's already found in the Word of God. And so if you want to know and learn about what's already available to you, simply start studying the Word of God and then start using it as your sword each and every day. It's been said that a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone that isn't. And it's so true. I wonder today if you feel like you're falling apart. Do you feel like you're stuck with nowhere to turn? Is there uncertainty of tomorrow? Is, is it causing questions for, for you today? Is there an emptiness in your soul that nothing seems to be able to fill? Is there a temptation that you just can't seem to overcome? Let me challenge you today to use your sword to find that there is salvation in Jesus Christ alone. There is hope when we trust in God's will. And there are answers to life's difficult times found in the Bible. And today, I trust 
and challenge that and challenge you that that you'll begin to use God's word as your sword to get you unstuck from these days of isolation to start living with greater intention and I pray today that you will give your heart to Christ in salvation. I pray that you'll devote yourself to doing His will. And I pray today that you'll begin living obediently according to the Word of God. And so today, this is our sword, and we trust in God's Word. And today, will you pray with me? Father, I pray today for all of us that we will use Your Word in greater and mightier ways. Lord, Your Word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Lord, Your Word is, is You. We find out about You and Your love for us and Your care for us and your, your forgiveness for us. We find out about Your Son Jesus who died and took our place so that when we confess our sins and trust in Him, we can be saved. We find out in Your Word that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us as Christians to be our comfort and to, our, to be our help. But Lord, we find in Your Word that there is wisdom, there is direction to lead us where we need to go and to help us during the dark days of our life. I pray today for someone who's not a Christian. May they become a believer today. May they confess their sins, believe in Your death, burial, and resurrection, and commit themselves to live for You. I pray for Christians today that they feel like they're stuck. And they realize today that you are able to pull them up out of the miry clay. That you're able to be that firm foundation of which we can stand. But Lord, someone today that just may need some direction. Lord, your word tells us that we can ask you who gives to all of us wisdom. And you give it to us liberally when we ask in faith. Today, Lord, please strengthen our faith during these days. May we not waste these days of just sitting at home or wondering what tomorrow might be and worried about what we didn't get accomplished yesterday. But Lord, may we take advantage of the opportunity we have today to read Your Word, to study it, to apply it in our lives, to use it as that sword so that we can grow stronger in You and that we can fight the devil when he tries to tempt us. Lord, we want to come out of these days of quarantine stronger Christians, stronger believers. And Lord, one of the only ways that we do that is when we grow stronger in Your Word. Jesus is always our supreme example. And He used His sword, Your Word, to help Him fight the, the devil and the enemy. And so Lord, today as Jesus used the Word of God, how much more important it is for us to do that as well. I pray today that we'll have a greater passion. And during these days, we'll start with a regular routine of reading Your Word and talking about it and living it out in front of our families and talking about it with them. And then Lord, using it to control what we say or do. And I pray, Lord, that everything is done to Your honor and to Your glory. Help us to move from this isolation to greater intention by using Your Word as our sword. And we pray this today in Christ's name. Amen.